and I've often risked my own life to do so. I've been involved in peacekeeping operations and have physically intervened in situations where ethnic cleansing has been threatened. In social media, I've been the subject of sustained assaults by particularly virulent anti-Israel networks that I won't name here today because I don't want to give them the benefit of any publicity. I've had my words willfully distorted and falsified in the social media even as recently as last night. In universities I've been the subject of demonstrations that have sought to silence me and sometimes succeeded. Most recently in the University of Sydney only last month. I've been publicly accused of corruption and being in the pay of the Zionist entity. <laughs> Mossad to be precise. I've got, I've got one observation on Mossad. They're a very effective intelligence service, one of the most respected in the world, probably the most respected in the world, but they're very, very bad at paying their checks. <laughs> I've been deliberately denied business opportunities. I've been subjected to virulent anti-Semitic hatred and threats, and I've been placed on a terrorist death list. Why is this? It's not because I speak out against the moral bankruptcy, corruption, incitement to terrorism, or oppression of the Palestinian Authority. It's not because, thank you very much, Professor. It's not because- You settled the check. <laughs> I, I, just, I just hope it's gin, not water. <laughs> it's not because I speak against the murder, brutality and terrorist violence of Hamas, Hezbollah or the Palestinian Islamic Jihad. I've spoken out at least as much in the media against Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, the Iranian regime and the IRGC, and many other sponsors of terror and terrorist groups, without anything like this level of attempted intimidation against me. It is for one reason, and that is that I fail to falsely condemn Israel in circumstances where to be even neutral on the subject is itself a crime in the eyes of so many. It's because I've gone further and use my military experience and my objective view to explain and defend Israel's legitimate military actions. Of course, in the eyes of many in this region, this is already heinous in and of itself. But it is only heinous in the Western world because of the distortions of the media that amplifies the message and helps mobilize a public that is persuaded to reject traditional values and now adopt a new, politically correct, moral relativity. How do we fight this new form of political warfare when so much of the media is the enemy? As with all battles, we must conduct both defensive and offensive operations. The defense, in this case, of course, revolves around doing what we can to ensure that the truth is made known. Both the truth about Israel's enemies and how they act and the crimes they commit, and the truth about Israel and how, it force, how its forces operate. This must of course be the truth. I'm not suggesting false propaganda. I include in this truth open admissions when errors and wrongdoing take place, including and especially when innocent people die as a consequence. This is one of the many things that separate us out from our enemies who so often refuse to tell or report the truth. The offence in this form of warfare is in exposing the bias, the distortions, the untruth of the media. This is much more difficult than telling the truth but it is also vital. As in all forms of war, the best form of defense is attack. Without effective offensive action, our defensive work will succeed much less and can never ever produce decisive results. Some good and vital work 
is already being done by a range of groups, including NGO Monitor, with which I'm associated. But all of our effects, all of our effects, good though they are, remain limited. This campaign, this offensive campaign, has had much tactical success and it needs to continue and, if possible, to intensify. But so far, there has been no real strategic impact. Nothing, nothing that has forced major media networks to fund fundamentally rethink their anti-Israel agenda. Of course, strategic effect requires strategic assets. And by strategic assets, I mean the combination of significant funds, concerted and sustained will, and large-scale, thoroughly planned, and carefully focused effort carried out by a large number of talented individuals. The challenge is, of course, immense. And as with any battle, there is absolutely no guarantee of success. As for myself, I have gone through the transmutation from infantry officer to fighter in this new form of political warfare. Much of my fight, as was recognised yesterday in the honour that was graciously and generously bestowed upon me here at Baralan University, is a fight for Israel. But to fight for Israel on the international media stage is also to fight for the values of democracy, freedom of speech and expression and civilised social values everywhere. All of the principles and virtues that once made Britain great are spoken about and are, are represented in the fight for Israel. Make no mistake, this afternoon I've spoken about Israel's fight, but the danger that faces Israel and that the media projects extend far beyond Israel and threaten us all. We should never forget the words of Pastor Martin Niemöller, who said, Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out, because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. Israel's fight is the Western world's fight. Upon Israel's survival, depends the survival of Western civilization. I am deeply honored by the award <coughs> of a doctorate from Baralan University, the warm support, encouragement, and friendship of this great seat of learning will certainly help to sustain me and to renew my vigor in this fight for Israel and for freedom that I shall never, ever give up. Thank you.